Lynn Shea, and I'm a professor in the Liberal Studies Department, and I coordinate the speaker series. So we're very excited tonight to have a cartoonist in the house. Um, I just would like to remind you, if you have a cell phone with you, could you please silence it right now? Um, as well, if you have a laptop, please mute your laptop. Okay. Um, if you didn't get a piece of paper and a pencil, or you don't have a writing utensil and something to write on, um, there is something right at the top. Okay. Um, top of the stairs. Um, without further ado, to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Meg Baronian, who is a professor in the writing department here at Lemmer College. And I'm so uh, welcome to the speaker series, everyone. This afternoon, we're really excited to have Hillary Price with us to talk about how she became a cartoonist. Uh, Hillary comes to us from Western Mass. She writes and draws rhymes with oranges, an award-winning syndicated comic strip published in national newspapers since 1995. Hillary teaches single panel cartooning at the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. Uh, in 2015, she received the Ink Pot Award for Career Achievement from San Diego Comic Con International. She's a storyteller who has appeared on the national public radio show, The Mom. Uh, Hillary has had a long and successful career as a cartoonist and has been generous enough to accept our invitation to speak today. Uh, so please welcome Hillary. Thank you. Thank you, man. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you. Yeah, here's, here, just read it. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Lynn, and thank you, Meg, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I love, oh, I should just say, this is a trigger warning, there will be the mention of, of the existence of a firearm, so just so people are prepared. Um, I love Putney. I've been to the used clothing store in Putney. I've been, Swirl, Swirl yeah. I've been to the co-op. I've been cross-country skiing here. I've met like at least six of the 12 residents of Putney. <laughs> so um, I love it here. Um, and I want to, I appreciate you guys coming here today, this afternoon, uh, to support the arts. And I know Landmark is a liberal arts college supporting the arts and the sciences. But I feel like in the outside world today, these two pursuits live, live more separately. So instead of arts and science, it's arts or science. And there's a lot of, yeah, it's ones that I know. I was like, yeah. Um, there's a lot of buzz about science, technology, <sighs> engineering, and math, and you even have your bold acronym STEM. But then for English, arts, and history, our acronym is eh. <laughs> so it's easy to answer why science is important. Here we are, all in an auditorium together, not holding our breath. You know, thank you, science. Um, but STEMers, we need the arts because we humans are more wired for stories than we are for data. And that's what the arts teach, storytelling. Think of how shaped we are by the stories we hear about the world or the stories people tell about ourselves or the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. So to live in a just and in a kind world where people of all types are valued, we need to change some of those storylines. So today I'm gonna to talk about leading a creative life and why it's hard and what's cool about it and how to keep at it. I'm gonna start by showing you a few cartoons so you can get just a sense of my sense of humor. Uh, so here we go. Bar and Grill, today's special, angel hair and meatballs. I'll have the angel meat. I'll have the hairballs. <laughs> cats. You can't be. Uh, who, who, have, who, have cats, who has cats around here? Oh, perfect. You can't be up here. I'm working. <laughs> you don't get it? Your cat, you drop your cat, and then your cat just jumps on your lap already. It's like this messing with a space-time continuum. 
Mm -hmm. uh, here's one. Husky, collie, beagle, <laughs> Afghan, poodle, pug, Yorkie, Shih Tzu, Corgi. Your hindsight is 2020. <laughs> and then, it's not about having two dads. Aquaman and Plastic Man are incredible parents. Then what's the issue, Ocean Plastic Man? <laughs> so now I've got some questions for you. So by show of hands, how many of you read comics now? Ooh. I mean, my grandparents will send me in the mail every now and again, so. OK, that counts. All right. So, so what comics? I'm going to write them down so that I have homework to read. They don't have to be newspaper comics. What comics do you love? Chat it out. Oh, Hark of Vagrant, yeah. What else? What? Web comics count, right? Yeah, web comics count, yes. Okay, good. What? Okay, good. So, like, it's not still updating, really, but, like, it's called Gloomverse, and, like, yeah. Gloom, Gloomverse? Yeah. Gloomverse, all right. Gloomverse, what else? What are some other comics we're sharing with one another? Yeah. Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine, yay! Okay, yeah, other web comics, other, yeah, chat them out. Avis Demon. Avis Demon? Ooh, okay, I've never heard of Avis. Am I spelling it right? Ava. Ava. Ava Demon. Avatar. What is it? Avatar. Avatar? Is that a comic too or just a movie? Yeah, they made a comic. Like that. Show, not the blue people movie. Oh, right. My partner's kids. They watch Avatar. Yeah. Repo? Re yeah. The Rock Opera? Repo. Nice. It's kind of a grimdark kind of telling about the future in a pandemic. Huh. <laughs> what a novel concept. It's much before COVID, like early 2000s. OK, OK. What a good prediction you guys have. All right, yeah, you guys up there. Spider-Man. Spider-Man? You read Spider-Man online? Yes. Yeah? Sometimes, but personally, my favorite version of the Spider-Man comics is Superior Spider-Man. Superior Spider-Man. OK. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh. Is that a Spider-Man? Uh, no. Superhero based. Superhero Invincible. Based. You guys, I'm getting some good reading. In Invincible. Did I spell it right? Okay. Oh, All right. Not the show, but there, there's a second season made throughout a webcomic. So. Over the Garden Wall. Are you guys learning some that you didn't know? All right. Yes. Uh, after the exilbeliefs. Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Did you have one? Bone. Yeah, okay. Great. Obelisk and bone. Now, do you, do you guys, do you tend to read, how do you read these? How do you consume them? Do you consume them on, in comic books or, or in, on your phone? Like, what is it? I consume them on off back end translator sites. <laughs> so on a computer then. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. I do both as well, reading them physically or online. Online, okay. But yeah. It's a lot more accessible online. Yeah. 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 Sometimes. Uh huh. Okay. On my phone, mainly. Yeah. On your phone? Mainly in the middle of the night. So. On your phone in the middle of the night. Who, who else reads them on your phone in the middle of the night? <laughs> Excellent. All right, we're going to move from there. So, so um, the digital world on our phone in the middle of the night, we, we live in a very visual world. And like cave people before us, we like to communicate now through pictures. Um, another question by show of hands. How many of you drew as a kid? OK, excellent. Excellent. And last question, and this is not to make you feel bad if you don't raise your hand, but how many of you draw now? Oh my god, this is like the best showing 
I've seen. A little bit, a little bit, okay. Depends on what you consider art. Oh, well. I'm technically an architect, so. All right. I'd say if you doodle, you know, flowers in the notebook, that counts. That counts. I would say that most of the time when I talk, maybe there's a couple people raising their hand that's, that still draw. And I think that there are, a real, there are good reasons why we tend to drop this. Um, that we decide that we're not going to stay fluent in this visual language, even though we're living in this visual world. And a friend of mine used to work at an art museum about an hour south of here in Springfield, Massachusetts. And she was in charge of signing the kids up for art class. And for the classes were really, really popular for the younger kids. But at a certain age, enrollment just dropped off. It's so sad. Can any of you guys guess what age? You can call it out. 13. 13. Wrong. 10. 5. 15. All right. You got one? On the teacher staple, some saying that they draw, you can't draw more than a stick figure, and they try to draw better, but they don't get proper credit to drawing the way they want to draw. And it's always like, and so we still have added type of mentality. You're stealing my talk right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we had 10. We had 10. I'm lower. Uh, eight. I heard eight. Who said eight? eight? Yes, eight. Eight is the time yeah, that, makes sense. that kids stop drawing. And before eight, all of us are like, give me the crayons. But after eight, what happens? Cartoonist Linda Berry talks about this time developmentally where art goes from, drawing goes from something you do, it's a verb, to something you make, it's a noun, right? And then suddenly you want this external thing that you made to be, whoa, here we go, guys, ripping stuff up. You want it to be good, right? Well, all right. So good means that your eyes can draw, your hands can draw what your eye can see, which is frustrating and it's limiting and it sends so many eight-year-olds into early retirement. So let it be known, some people are out there trying to fight the forces of evil. I am here trying to fight the forces of good. So as kids, we drew, it was fun. And once we learned it had to be good, we drew and we felt insecure. So let's unpack why. My buddy, the, uh, Mo Willems, the children's book author, asks this question. Why do kids quit art when they realize they aren't going to go pro, but they don't quit sports? You guys notice this bat? <laughs> Or just a, just an outward question. Well, I'm going to try and answer that. I'll, I'll try and answer that. Here's what I think. I think that kids see adults play sports way more than they see them draw, right? Maybe their parents play golf or pick up basketball or pickleball. Um, then there's the NHL, the NFL, the MLB, the CIA. No. Um, <laughs> But think, when is the last time that you saw an adult just draw right in front of you? This is a rhetorical question. Okay. It's important. So modeling is important. I was lucky as a kid. After dinner every night, my dad would take out his fancy pen from his suit pocket and smooth out his paper napkin and draw on it. Now, my dad was in the clothing business. And he did that because his dad was in the clothing business. And he did that because he was in the clothing business. At that time, you didn't really have a choice. Or for him, he didn't really have a choice about what he wanted to do. He was way more into hunting, fishing, and fixing small engines. So instead of drawing ruffle tops and spaghetti straps, every night he drew guns. <laughs> Love, dad. <laughs> So even though I didn't share his passion, I got to see an adult draw just for the fun of it. 
and it planted a seed that you didn't have to grow out of drawing. So from my mom, I learned that drawings had this almost magical power. Remember being little, now this, this is a question that is not rhetorical. Being little and snooping around your parents' house when they weren't home, by show of hands, how many of you did that? Okay, those of you that didn't show, did it are missing out, and there's still time. So my mom kept, um, this, kept silk scarves in a plastic box under their bed, and one day in the scarf box I found this folded up piece of paper at the bottom of it, and I unfolded it, and I found a hand-drawn cartoon to my mom from David. <laughs> <laughs> this, this came with it. This came with it. It says, I don't know if you can read it, it says, I am a lovable little savage. <laughs> so this was from David, and my dad's name is Michael. <laughs> so David was an old high school sweetheart, and uh, there was, you know, she had just held on to this. And recently when I asked my mom if she still had this picture and could she, you know, get it out and take a picture of it for me, uh, she said, oh no, it's not in the scarf box anymore, but I can find it. And I said, where did you put it? And she says, in the safe, with the wills. <laughs> and I said, does dad know? And she's like, mm-mm. <laughs> So there was one other family dynamic that kept me drawing. Um, I was the youngest. My older sister uh, is a big t talker, and I felt that I could never get a word in. And so the blank piece of paper was a place to express myself where I had the mic all to myself. So one time when I was 12, um, I was obsessed with this one artist known only to me as Boynton. So here's an example of Boynton with these, this little hippo and I used to copy this hippo. Exactly. Uh, yes, hold that thought. So um, I would copy, and I would copy. <laughs> so this is a real page from, you know, that, that we found in a drawer. I love the hippo inside of a hippo. Um, Yes, yes. So I remember being in a stationery store and there were two women talking in the row over of how much they loved this artist Boynton. And they said her first name, which was Sandra. And my jaw dropped because I was like, what? Boynton was a Sandra? I had just assumed that Boynton was a George or a, or a Todd. Um, and so it was the first time that I knew of a female cartoonist. I didn't, prior to that, I didn't know that women drew. And my thought was then, at that moment, well, if she could do it, then I could do it. So already, here's one takeaway from this talk. Whatever you find yourself doing for a career, try to be visible about it. Just by showing yourself, you're gonna allow other people to change their story of what they think is possible for their own lives. And I am living proof of that. So I'm gonna get back to fighting the powers of good in a little bit, but I wanna move on to the kind of college young adult chapter of my story. So for a long time, my cartooning habit was reserved for notebook margins, dorm room whiteboards, and like my mom's long lost uh, boyfriend, the occasional Valentine. It struck me uh, funny, if something struck me funny in a class, I'd doodle something and I'd show it to a friend and I got laughs and that felt good. Uh, I even dropped some cartoons off at, a school, at my school newspaper. They never got back to me and I never followed up. Uh, after my third year of college, I decided I needed a break from school. And I'd applied to a study abroad program and they didn't let everybody in, so. I decided I would go to the place that many young Jews flock to find themselves. It begins with an I. That's right, Ireland. <laughs> oh. 
Already, I'd spent three months in Dublin, and my employment record for the first time in my life was spotty. I quit the cocktail waitressing job. The more cocktails I served, the less enjoyable the clientele. Kind of like this guy. <laughs> I loved you in Star Wars. <laughs> my next job was Miller's Pizza Kitchen. One evening, I was waiting on the manager and the owner, and everything was going fine. I served them a large <laughs> extra cheese pizza with pepperoni. Uh, I came back the next day, and I wasn't on the schedule. I asked why, and the manager turned to me and said, you're a lovely girl, but you're slow, and you seem to invite trouble wherever you go. <laughs> I was fired. <laughs> and called slow, but I had to face facts. I did not have that extra special zip necessary to serve pizza. So, what talents did I have? I found myself wandering around Dublin trying to figure out what to do next. And on the newsstand, I noticed a Schumer magazine. And inside were single panel cartoons like the ones that I'd seen in the New Yorker. It was called The Phoenix. So at this time, since I had some holes in my schedule, my parents came to visit, and this proved to be a very fateful move. Dubliners pride themselves on their rich literary history. And there's a big bronze statue in the central square that pays homage to this man, James Joyce, with those signature glasses, the darling of Professor Rose. See here? Ooh. So on the first day, I'm showing my mom and dad around, and we come to a statue, the statue. And my mom, uninitiated, sees the statue, sees the man, sees the glasses, and says, look, it's Elton John. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so. After my parents left, I drew up what my mom had said, and I found the Phoenix's Magazine's address in that ancient yellow text called the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> I biked the two miles to a nondescript office building, walked up a dark staircase, and knocked. No answer. So I slipped my cartoons underneath the door and rode home. Two weeks later, I opened the magazine and I saw this. The tourist season begins. I can tell by the glasses, it's Elton John. So, and then a week after that, a check arrived. And in that moment, cartooning jumped from something I did to maybe something that I could do. So the next year, I graduated college and, I, and got my English degree. So here we go. Here's me. So happy graduating my college. Here we go. I've got my little cap. So it was time to get a real job. <laughs> My hope was to get paid to write. Advertising seemed like a real job. So to get work at an agency, uh, you create a portfolio of made up ads. And I used some cartoons in them. And that got the attention of the boss. Someone was on uh, paternity leave. Uh, so I filled in. I, it was challenging. And I wasn't bad at it. But I, I didn't love it. In fact, I wasn't even sure that I liked it. I didn't like sitting by myself in a cubicle all day. I felt uncomfortable trying to be clever about things I didn't know anything about. One of my accounts was industrial weed killer. <laughs> I can kill a house plant, but that's where my experience ends. So there were no iPhones back then to break up the time. If you wanted to go out and take a break, you had to take up smoking. <laughs> so. But in a few months, uh, an opening for a full-time position came, and I applied for it anyway, because I wanted to get the job, 
you know, more than the job. Uh, the creator director asked me into his office. He sat down. I sat down. Then he said, I'm not going to hire you, but I think you're going to make it. So I learned two big things from my time there. One is that the only way to figure out if you like a job is to try a job. And two, if you are ever going to fire somebody, there is so much of a nicer way to do it. Like that was the nicer way to do it. And if you ever meet the Miller's Kitchen pizza manager. Hit him in the face. I didn't say it, but. <laughs> so I spent the next couple of months trying to imagine myself and the job of whoever came walking down the street. So. Did I want this person's job? You know? It could get tiring, but you'd get to work outside. UPS guy. Right? Did I want this person's job? Well, that would mean going to law school. Was I ready to jump back into more school? Then this person walked by. Did I want this person's job? <laughs> What was this person's job? Hippie. Professional hippie. Hippie? <laughs> so. Oh, high school teacher. I want to go to that high school. <laughs> so I was scanning the job listings in the newspaper, and I noticed that the paper sometimes published single panel New Yorker S cartoons in their book review section, not their comics page, but in their book review section. Hold on, we'll do questions at the end. Um, so I called up the editor on the phone, and I asked, would she meet with me? She liked my work, and I started to appear in that book review section. Here's one from the 1990s. You see, liberal and conservative, and says, Sylvia checked the social climate, then begrudgingly went to shave her legs. <laughs> um, I got paid $35 per tune. As the old saying goes, going into cartooning to get rich is like going into boxing to get smart. <laughs> so I, uh, I contacted five different syndicates. And what a syndicate is, is they act as an, an agent, like, for a, like a Hollywood agent. But they represent you, and they sell your work to newspapers. That's what a syndicate is. Um, I got four rejection letters and one nibble. The editor said, I like your writing. Send us 14 more. You've got two weeks. So I did. And after the two weeks, well, OK, you, this was the time I had never done a FedEx envelope, you know, the thing where you have to fill it out. So yeah, well, so what I ended up doing is that I filled it out, but I didn't know what I was doing, so I sent it to myself. <laughs> so anyway. Um, we went back and forth for uh, like this for a while, and then he says, "Okay, we'll give you three grand to draw seven strips a week for nine months, and if we like you at the end of that trial period, we'll give you a contract." So that comes out to ten dollars a day for nine months, and while I didn't live live large and I had odd jobs, uh, I didn't have student loans, and I just want to recognize my privilege in that. That, that, that I had that, that leg up, and I just want to acknowledge that. So over the nine months, I started to build my cartooning muscle from this to this. Uh, exactly. Yes. Uh, they didn't want to know if I had one joke in me. They wanted to know if I could do it for the long haul. And at the end of the nine months, they offered me the contract. And Rhymes with Orange has appeared in newspapers uh, first appeared in 1995. So I've drawn a lot of cartoons since then, but it's important to me that everybody knows that I got creative help. There's this pervasive myth about art that the clouds part and the light comes shining down and it's always on one person and it's usually a guy and it's usually white and it's usually heterosexual and it's just so country club. So in my case, it's been a team effort. I welcome getting cartoon ideas from other people. And when I do get them, I pay them for them. 
I never once inked a strip before first getting feedback on it. I believe in the creative power of collaboration. We all know that Seth Meyers works with a team of writers, but did you know that Michelangelo had a studio full of assistants? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, never mind then. You have to participate. You have to get out once. We live on Wikipedia. Nice. I like that. All right. So the first 22 years of the strip, I was all in charge. But by the end, I was feeling burned out. So those seven a week deadlines were really starting to grate on me. But five years ago, I teamed up with Rena Piccolo, a cartoonist living in Toronto. It's given me and the strip energy. So here's an example of our collaboration. She sent me this, the inventor. How's that gym idea coming along? I'm not getting anywhere with it. And then we turned it into this. BCYMCA. Is this where the spin class meets? Well, later on, I'll tell you. Um, I picked up a few tricks about sustaining creativity over time, and I wanted to share those with you. Because we all have a creative spark, and we all want to be heard, whether it's through drawing, or music, or dance, or poetry. Um, but no matter what it is, we all end up doing battle with those forces of good. Their favorite thing these forces of good like to tell you is that you suck. Their second favorite thing to tell you is that there's just no time, because there's always laundry to fold and email to check and bills to pay. And it's convincing, because there's, a, there's some truth to it. Life is very busy. But know this. Some of those forces of good are just scared little monsters that are afraid that if you put yourself out there and you make art and you show it to people, it's scary and you're gonna get hurt, so it's better to just stay safe and scroll on your phone. Have compassion for these little monsters. Listen to their fears, then plop them in the back seat and continue on. So here's how you do that. It took me about 10 years to get these five pieces of advice, so I'm gonna save you 10 years of time and just tell you all of them now. So here's the kind of weirdest one, but it is by Holly Black, the fantasy writer. In order to make something, you have to be willing to ruin it. And what I mean by this is that when we have the perfect idea in our head, it will never be as beautiful or as perfect as when we try to set it down onto paper. And so our job is to ruin it with our best efforts. And I was talking to Sophia, uh, not to call you up, but here I am calling you up. And she was telling me about how Landmark really focuses on the growth mindset here. And I would say that the forces of good hate the growth mindset. Um, here is my second piece of advice, which is when you work regularly, inspiration strikes regularly. And when I don't draw every day, but there is a secret special yoga position that helps me make art. It is called derriere in the chair, <laughs> right? So there's body memory there. My butt tells my brain it's time to start working. So I think that people mistake their creative pursuits like it's dessert at the end of their day, and either they deserve dessert or they don't deserve dessert. And it's I would want to uh, have you throw that metaphor in the trash, because it's not dessert. It's nourishment. All right, this next piece of advice is from a guy you've probably heard about. Where is it? Where'd it go? Oh, it's stuck to the other piece of paper behind it. There we go. Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, boy. Jerry Seinfeld says, set a timer. If you can do 30 minutes in your creative session, Make your session 20. If you can do an hour, make it 45 minutes. Never completely exhaust yourself. Then reward yourself by stopping when the alarm goes off. 
I use this in my classes all the time for us to do exercises together. I highly recommend it as a tool to get you to sit down. Now, sitting down is the hardest part. That yoga position is the hardest thing to do. And I will admit that I do a lot of procrastinate cleaning. So this is what my day looks like before I sit down to work. <laughs> and at the end of my timer, I double my reward by taking my very large dog out for a walk. Aww. I know. What's your name? Bam Bam. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes what can happen is that even though you've turned off your timer, you can trust that your subconscious is still at work and good ideas can come to you. The carrot. Fetch the ball! How come you don't fetch the ball? How come you don't throw a squirrel? <laughs> So this next piece of advice is from me, which is have an accountability buddy. We are all so much better at keeping the promises we make to other people, to other friends, to other colleagues than we are to the promises that we make to ourselves. So find someone you can show your work to and who will show their work to you. This creates a deadline, right? How many of you would do a problem set if you didn't have a deadline? Oh, okay, really? Yes. All right, two of you out of 10,000. All right, three, three. Um, it is no coincidence that these two words sound alike. So, yeah. <laughs> That's all right, it's supposed to get a giggle. Um, all right, here's, here's my last piece. Not sure how to start. Start with what's bothering you. So your anxieties, your frustrations, your challenges, this is all creative fodder. A cartoonist friend of mine said that he was like an oyster. Something gets under his skin and he works at it and he works at it and he works at it until a pearl comes out. So cartoons are all about anxiety, fear, and frustration. It is the secret sauce to making something funny. Mm -hmm. Anxiety about being alone, the hope. So, come here often? It's a Kleenex, it's a Kleenex box. Or fear about getting older. You're not alone. Many struggle with birthdays. Yeah, but do they live in a zoo? Do they look like a monkey? Do they smell like one too? <laughs> or frustration about being heard. The restraint. Walk, please. P-L-E-E-S. If we reward him, he'll never value spelling. <laughs> So I'm going to walk you through two cartoons and how they came to be. So the first one, I'm not going to show it yet, but I, I, was, I was walking into a cafe. And uh, I walked in, and then I noticed once, I was, once I'd walked in that it was no longer a cafe. It was, it was an e-fac, right? Because that is how, that's what it's spelled like when you're inside the cafe. Um, and I go down, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm reading the comics. And I, as I'm reading along, I see that there is an artist, and he's drawn a comic about a boy who is inside of a zoo. But he forgot to flip the zoo backwards. And I was like, oh, huh. I think there's a nugget of a cartoon idea. So that turned into this. One day, we're going to bust out of this ooze. <laughs> so I often come up with the writing part, the joke first. And then I see my cartoon like the stage of a play. And so I audition who should be doing these lines. And you want to keep the stakes high. You want it to be something like big, like a polar bear versus cute, like a, like a rabbit or a chipmunk, right? 
the higher the stakes are, the more funny, the more, the more bang for your buck. So that was this one cartoon. Uh, the next cartoon comes from a practice exercise that I do almost week, or I do weekly with my accountability buddy. I have an accountability buddy now. And I call it the justification game. Oh boy, oh boy. no, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm ready. All right, you're ready. So what I do is I make a list on one side of my piece of paper and I just randomly list, she and I go back and forth, we trade places, an animal, a person, or a profession. So on this day, it was goblins, golfer, snake, dentist, pirates, bird, bus driver, karaoke singer, dog walker, and chef. So then I turn this piece of paper over and I make another list. And I don't look at the first one. And it's a situation or a prop. And so on this day, I had written bobbing for apples with an ax or shovel, on strike, with glasses, fake blood, with knitting needles, beside a highway, in a boat, getting a haircut, and in underwear. So then what I try and do is I try and pick Two, one from each side and justify why this would make sense. So that day I chose snake and I chose with knitting needles. <laughs> right? And that turned into this cartoon. Anyone can knit. Anyone can knit. <laughs> Leonard was hopeful. So when a cartoon is working, it takes a stories we all know and draws different conclusions from them. So here is an example of that. Adam and Eve, the trouble didn't start after I ate the apple. It was after I ate the mushroom. That's when the snake started talking. <laughs> So my, my oyster cartoonist described it this way. A cartoon disrupts a cliche, right? A cliche can be a fairy tale. It can be a saying. It can even be a shape. So here it is disrupting a shape. Look, Dad, the red part is over there, and the blue part is over there. Science finally caves to politics. <laughs> At a place like Landmark, it seems like the mission is not to let someone else's story of who you are become your own story. You are disrupting the cliche of who neuro neurodiverse people are. So before we wrap things up, I'd like you all to close your eyes, take a second, and think about some creative project that you've either wanting to do or wanting to get back to. So you're going to close your eyes. I'm going to count to 15. In, on the inside, and just think of it. Okay, now I want you to set that side, set that thought aside for a second. We're going to come back to it. Now, I'd like everybody to please take out the pencil and paper that they got when they walked in, or use your own pencil and piece of paper. Doesn't matter. So remember how in the beginning I asked uh, all of you um, if you were drawers now? And a lot of you raised your hands, but some of you didn't raise your hand. Um, what you didn't realize is that it's kind of a trick question because you do draw every day, every day, you just don't recognize it as drawing. Cartoonist Linda Berry, the same cartoonist that I mentioned in the beginning, talks about how when we were first learning the alphabet, we didn't write our letters, we drew our letters. So what we're gonna do right now is we're all gonna draw a chicken with letters, okay? So, and I, no, I'm gonna show you how. We are going to spell out this chicken. Ready? First, we're going to draw an upside down D. Smiley face. Then, 
we're going to draw an A on top of our D. Next, we're going to bring an O into the picture. We're going to draw an O. Now, we're going to draw a V off of our O facing this way. <laughs> now we're going to bring the M's into the picture. We're going to draw an M right here, and an M, a big M right here, and then another M right here. Now we're going to bring in the U's. We're going to draw a U here and a U here. Then we're going to bring the L's into the picture, two backwards L's. We're going to add an O. And then we are going to add a period. OK. So now, could everyone please hold up their chickens? I would like to take a photo of this artwork. Here, wait. I'll get up closer, too. All right. All right. Now, I want you to think again about that creative project. And your drawing is a reminder, oh, awesome, not to be a chicken. Right? You are not chickens. You guys are landmark sharks. So thank you so much for having me. And let's take some questions. say is like your um, be it values in life or artistic um, inspiration per se, someone that you inspire to be either be value or art level? Gosh, there are so many artists. First. So I mean, in terms of, oh gosh, you know, I, I feel like I could name a lot of my friends who have showed up in this room of people that I am that I admire and like the way that they live their values. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say that I, would, that I have like a, a person up on a pedestal. A pedestal. And then for artwork, um, well, I am a huge fan of the cartoonist Dave Coverley, who draws a single panel strip called Speed Bump. I've heard of that. I've heard of Speed Bump. Yeah, check it out. I mean, there are so many people that I like. Linda Berry, who I mentioned in this talk, she is incredible. Um, I also like Amy Huang. Amy Huang is a cartoonist in The New Yorker. I like her work a lot. Um, so those are, those are a few people. Yeah. Yes, back there. Uh, I'm not a cartoonist, but I'm a creative. And I find that the most difficult part of it is initializing. Where once I get started, I could just keep going. Yes. But it's the matter of actually starting that's a problem. So what advice do you have? What do you find works for you to actually you know, start the ball rolling? I mean, I, I, would, I would set that timer. That's what I would do, is set that timer and just say that at the end of it, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm going to put my phone in the other room. Well, you have to hear the timer. But still, <laughs> I'd put it on the, but in the other room so that I, and it doesn't matter if you don't do your creative thing. You could stare at the wall. You just can't, you just can't be on your phone. I mean, and what inevitably ends up happening is that once you get over that hump, once you get started, then you're, you're, it's, it's, you're sliding some, and you've got momentum. And then you just keep going and going and going. 
Yeah, but then stop. Then stop. Don't exhaust yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question. How do you keep your energy going? Like for me, I'm someone for whenever I start painting, no matter how, like if I'm doing it for like ten minutes or barely even five, I can't keep the energy up to keep on going. How do you keep up your energy? I, I mean, I would say that. I mean, short term, right? Set set that timer for ten minutes, mm -hmm. right? And then later on, have somebody that you're going to show your painting to, mm -hmm. so you know that by Friday or two weeks from now, I'm showing a finished painting to my friend, and then that person is going to show me their painting, and then we're going to discuss it. And the fact that you're going to be like, I can't let down my friend. That is going to help you with the, with the momentum aspect. But I get that it's hard. It is hard. It's just the, I think there's habit to it. And I also think, too, that when is the time that you have the most energy during the day? And to figure that out and maybe set aside 10 minutes for your painting then. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, why did you choose the name? Oh, okay. So my aunt once told me when I was a kid that nothing rhymed with the word orange. And so I just kind of kept that in my back pocket. And then when it came time to name the strip, I was an unusual voice on the comics page, right? I was young. I was gay. I was female. Um, I was living in San Francisco, you know, with a futon and five other roommates. So, um, I wanted this, the, the name of the strip to kind of reflect that this wasn't a, a, a voice on the comics page that was out there, and also to have a little joke about um, kind of in the title itself. So, yeah, Will. Uh, was there someone in your personal life, uh, was someone in your personal life that you would say inspired you? Did anyone inspire you to enter? appear as a cartoonist, or was that like, um, was that just out of soul, I want to do a sort of thing? I think that my parents were worried that I would find a job that would, you know, pay my, pay my rent and, and such. They wanted, even now, my dad says to me, like, if the cartooning doesn't work out, <laughs> have you considered teaching? <laughs> And um, so I don't, so I would, I would say that I, um, I didn't really come from an artistic family, um, but I came from a family that, that uh, I think they were supportive, um, but, and my mom was good about, like, if I wanted to take art classes as a kid, supportive that way. Um, but I think that, uh, Kristen, can you answer this? This is my partner, Kristen. Can I answer a question? Yeah, could you just her? come up here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 basically. I don't know, I think you're an outlier in your family. I think I'm an outlier in my family. I think that's the answer. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate that. Do you have any more questions? She's right there. Uh, yes, Coca-Cola. Um, that's not my name. Well, <laughs> it says. <laughs> Outside of like drawing, do you have any other hobbies? Oh, I well, I like to play pickleball. Pickleball. In fact, my pickleball people are are in this. They have flooded the auditorium. Um, I also like to the audience with, with pickle with pro pickleball sympathizers. Exactly, pro pickleball sympathizers. Um, I I really I like to move my body a lot, so I like. I like to play ice hockey. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I like um, I like anything having to do with snow. And I, I I've loved these winter storms. Um, so skiing and snowboarding and sledding and cross country skiing. Um, so I feel like and and I spend a lot of time with my dog. You know, we spend a lot of time together, and I really enjoy being outside with, with him. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you're, when you're working on a, a cartoon, what, what makes you, and you have an idea, and you're developing it, what makes you 
kind of sit back and go, okay, like this is a good comic. Like people will get this, people will like this. Like what the what are the things you think about? Okay. That's a really good question because a comic goes through phases, right? You first get the idea, and then it's a lot like writing a paper. You need to simplify the idea and amplify the important parts to it. And then what happens is you have to let it rest. It's like baking bread or making jello. Like it needs to take some time. So you put it aside and you come back to it later, right? So because you lose perspective on it. You get too close to it. And then one thing that I did for so many years is that I had an office mate, and on Friday mornings, I would take her out to breakfast, and she would look at my cartoons. And she was a graphic designer. So even though she wasn't a cartoonist, she knew, she knew words and she knew pictures. So she was my accountability buddy. And she was a fresh pair of eyes. And Kristen also is an excellent fresh pair of eyes for me. So I like to show it around and get feedback because sometimes I either think it's terrible and therefore you know, junk, and it's not. I've just been looking at it too long. Or I think it's amazing, but nobody gets it. <laughs> so that's why it's really important to um, pause, come back to it, and show it. Yes? How do you feel about all the terrific film? Because it's like many people say that this is a risky job. I, I'm going to get a little closer because I can't hear you well enough. Say again, because my ears. Uh, uh, getting into this job, were you like always a, uh, absolutely sure of yourself that this is what you wanted to do and that, that you were going to succeed because I know it's a risky job to get into it? So the question is, did I always, was I always sure that this was the job for me, right? And that, um, you know, <laughs> yes and no. The, y the, y the, the no is that I like to be around people, and this is a very solitary job. So I, have to, I think that's why I play a lot of team sports, in order to get people around me. So in that way, it's been a tougher fit. But one of the things about um, the about going into this business is that they make you sign a contract. My first contract was for 15 years. I was on the hook for 15 years unless they fired me. So I think that I just kept going. Um, and that was a pretty hard external deadline. I guess I could have stopped, but I had made this commitment. So. No, and, and the industry's really changed, too. Like, it used to be that there were many newspapers in a town, and so there would be competing newspapers, and so there was, like a, there was a market that was a way to make a living. But now newspapers have really, uh, there might be one in one, there might be a newspaper in a town, or there might not be. Or people don't subscribe to the newspapers the way they used to because they look at them on their phone. And comics, the way people re read newspapers, it was like death, destruction, storm, and then comics were the sweet treat at the end. And now when you're on your phone, it doesn't work like that. So comics don't really have their place the way they used to have their place in a, in a print medium. And so the business has really changed and contracted. And so... Um, I think now, if someone's going to be drawing comics, they're not going to be doing it in print. They're going to be doing a, a web comic. And there's, that's a different business model. So that's the long answer to your question. I'm sure I could go on, but <laughs> all right. I think we're going to stop there. Okay. So let's, once again, thank you. Thank you. And Will, thank you. And Sophia, thank you.